So we've spent a lot of time going over the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle is certainly complex. There's a lot of different elements to it. And it represents one of the more important of the element cycles. So it's just important to spend a lot of time going over the nitrogen cycle. That being said, every element has its own cycle. And we need to, to be a complete ecosystem scientist, we need to understand a lot of those different element cycles because sometimes we need to think strongly about the sulfur cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the calcium cycle. These are all gonna be interrelated, for example, but other element cycles are important. As far as the purposes of the course and the book is concerned, they don't spend a lot of time going over the other element cycles. So we're not gonna go through the sulfur, sulfur cycle in detail, for example. That being said, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on the phosphorus cycle. And it's important to note that the differences among elements in the source of that element, so whether they come from the rocks or the atmosphere, the chemical properties of each of the elements in its different forms, and plant demand leads to predictable patterns and rates of element cycling. So if you wanna say, how does one cycle differ from the nitrogen cycle, for example? Well, can that element be derived from rocks or is it atmospherically derived? And then what are the different chemical properties of those elements and how similar are they to the different forms of nitrogen we talked about. Lastly, is it are they elements that plants demand a lot of or not a lot of? Are they macro elements or micro elements? And once you know these, you can get into relatively predictable patterns in how those elements cycle. So we're gonna just spend a little bit of time on the phosphorus cycle, which is a good counterpoint to the nitrogen cycle. And phosphorus is a nutrient whose cycling through vegetation is most tightly coupled to nitrogen. So it's a nutrient that's used in relatively high amounts. It's a macro element. And we see relatively constrained nitrogen to phosphorus ratios in soils and in microbes. So for all intents and purposes, there's a relatively low range of N to P, which means that those systems or those plants that have a high demand for nitrogen also have a high demand for phosphorus. If you think about how nitrogen is used in, in plants, for example, in amino acids, those plants that have a lot of demand for nitrogen also have a lot of demand for phosphorus as far as DNA is concerned or ATP. So what are the major differences in the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles if nitrogen and phosphorus tend to be demanded in similar amounts? Well, if you take a look at a really basic representation of the nitrogen cycle, here's organic nitrogen, ammonium, and nitrate. They can be lost out the bottom. It can be lost gaseous forms and brought in from the atmosphere. There's also plant uptake of these different forms. So start with the source and thinking about phosphorus. For all intents and purposes, most of our nitrogen that enters into an ecosystem is gonna come from the atmosphere and initially it's going to be fixed from N2. Phosphorus, on the other hand, tends to come from rocks. It's a geological source. So instead of it coming from the atmosphere, it comes from rocks. Now we have a lot of different forms of nitrogen, for example, but really we just have an organic form of nitrogen, just like nitrogen, and then some form of phosphate that has the same oxidation state. Nitrogen has a lot of different oxidation states that's present. When we think about losses, for all intents and purposes, we can lose nitrogen to gaseous forms. And there's no gaseous form of phosphorus that tends to be lost. Instead, it can become bound and essentially lost from the system. There's some situations where you can have leaching, but leaching is just not a strong loss. So nitrogen can be lost in gaseous forms or in solution. And for all intents and purposes, that doesn't happen for phosphorus. So the phosphorus cycle, in many respects, is a lot simpler than the nitrogen cycle. We don't have to worry about atmospheric inputs as much, although dust in some systems can be an important form of phosphorus that's entering the system. We don't have to worry about differences in redox states either. Now the weathering of phosphorus from rocks depends on essentially acids. And here we have carbonic acid that's being produced from respiration of plants and microbes. And you need a rock form of, phosph of phosphate that's gonna be relatively labile. This is a case where 
you have phosphorus containing apatite that can react with carbonic acid to release phosphate. And the authors state that when we think about this in different landscapes, we often have a lot of phosphate being mineralized in, in situations where you don't necessarily have a lot of nitrogen being made available. So rock weathering can occur in the absence of organic mineralization of nitrogen. Now, just like we said before, if we want to think about what's unique about the phosphorus cycle, there are just no oxidation reduction reactions. Phosphorus has the same redox state in its different forms, so that simplifies the system. Geochemical reactions are a lot more important with a phosphorus cycle. So there's a lot of sources of phosphorus and sinks for phosphorus that are geochemical reactions. They're not biochemical. So microbes might facilitate them to a certain degree, but this is primarily just chemistry. One unique aspect of the phosphorus cycle is that you can have insoluble precipitates. That doesn't happen with nitrate. Nitrate just doesn't form insoluble precipitates. So this is a form by which available phosphorus can be lost from an ecosystem. It's still present there, but it's not in an available form. Because it forms these insoluble precipitates, we can mine the earth for phosphorus. And that's why, as far as fertilizer is concerned, we can go and get phosphorus-rich rock and turn that into fertilizer. So, and that's just something we can't do with nitrogen. We talked about how some sedimentary rocks can still have nitrate on it from when it was laid down as a sediment, but for all intents and purposes, it's not mined like the way phosphorus is. Because it forms insoluble precipitates, this is a way that, that phosphorus availability can decline. And it's important to know that this is going to be pH dependent, and especially at low pH, you can form insoluble precipitates. Not only can phosphate react with, with aluminum, but also you can have insoluble calcium containing precipitates here. And so there's a number of cations that phosphate can react with that are relatively insoluble. The abundance of these is going to differ as pH changes. So this is a comparison of the different element cycles that we see with respect to phosphorus that happens at different pH. So if you look on the x-axis we have soil pH and then percentage of distribution. So if you look in a really acidic soil you can have fixation of phosphorus associated with iron, aluminum, or manganese and when you're into the high pH, it's really reaction with calcium that generates calcium phosphate. Intermediate pHs, you can also have silicate reactions, but here really is the important part, is taking a look at relatively available phosphates, and that happens at an intermediate pH. So pH of six to seven is when you get the largest amounts of available phosphate. pH is too high, calcium phosphate tends to form and you lose available phosphate that way. pH is too low and you might get something like an iron phosphate that forms and you lose pH. So intermediate pHs are the best. Lastly, they talk about occluded phosphorus, which are these forms of phosphorus that for all intents and purposes cannot be mineralized or acidified to generate phosphate. Occluded phosphorus can be a large proportion of the phosphorus in ecosystems that are highly weathered or have soils that are highly weathered and essentially represents an unavailable form of phosphorus. So although your phosphorus content can be high, there's a lot of phosphorus in the soils, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's available to plants.